What up, HyperChange? Welcome to another episode. Today we're doing a sort of impromptu podcast um, all about the SpaceX IPO, um, the potential for people to invest in SpaceX. Um, this is kind of, I don't even really have this planned out very well because I was working on something behind the scenes, which I'm going to explain right now. Um, and then today, as I'm recording this, it's Thursday, news came out that SpaceX is considering uh, spinning off Starlink as a private company, IPOing that separately from SpaceX, which is totally was not what I was expecting. Um, this The COO, Gwen Shotwell, was at the JP Morgan conference. I'm just going to read you the quote so I get it exactly um, right. Right now, we are a private company, but Starlink is the right kind of business that we can go ahead and take public. So that is what the COO, basically Elon Musk's number two person at SpaceX, basically running the company, Gwen Shotwell, has said at an investor conference. That turned into a whole Bloomberg article, which is now spreading across the internet like crazy. And a bunch of you are asking me, what is going on here? What do I what do I think is happening? So taking a step back, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was approached by one of my friends and basically said, yo, do you have do you want to invest in SpaceX? Because I think there's an opportunity to invest in SpaceX. So this is what I've been working on behind the scenes is if you're an accredited investor, um, which I am, which is a whole nother story. But to invest in private companies, you have to be what's called accredited, a certain type of investor, which I think is a super messed up law. And basically restricts anybody with less than a certain amount of income or assets from being able to invest in private companies and startups. This means only VCs and rich people are investing in startups. And I think it's a very messed up rule, frankly. Um, but I recently got an accredited investor because of my holdings of HyperChange, the media company. So on paper, I'm technically accredited, which means I have the opportunity to invest in these kind of deals. Um, and so I got this SpaceX deal or I got this opportunity that said, look, SpaceX, we might have a chunk if you want to put in a little bit of money, um, here's an opportunity. So I've been scrambling, even hitting up people to try and get loans to figure out how to put money into this because I was so, so excited. Um, I've been analyzing SpaceX more and more. I think there's huge opportunity to invest in this, um, and especially at the valuation of around 33 to 34 billion. And so I started talking to this, talking to deals, talking to my friends, and the overwhelming response to everyone who I offered to get in or was like, hey, are you interested? I'm just kind of trying to help my friends out. Everyone is basically like, oh my God, I want in. The demand is off the charts. How do we get into SpaceX? And I started realizing more and more that there's just such a huge pent up opportunity where every single, so many people who are like closest to Elon Musk, who are following the company closely, who believe in going to space, who believe in this technology and getting to Mars um, are desperate to get into SpaceX. They have no way to access the cap table. I think this is like a microcosm of exactly what's wrong in the entire investment world. Uh, the most exciting technology companies are not available to the public who understands them and is most passionate about them. I hate that. And so I've been feeling more and more guilty of just like, well, am I going to get in this deal and not be able to tell my subscribers about it? And it just feels unfair that I get into this deal and that all of you watching who are just as passionate about SpaceX, who put in, believe in it just as much, who have the money, who may be accredited, can't access it at all. And especially people who aren't accredited, but just want to put a little money in. Like, I just think it's so messed up that you don't have access. So in the background, I've been going through all of this like emotion and trying to be like, how do I do this at the same time? Like, I do want to put money into SpaceX and so and you might it's really hard to get the opportunity to do it with a really small amount of money which is what I would need so anyway um been feeling more guilty about this and had a moonshot Monday this is why I tweeted like I'm scheming on something big with the rocket and the bell emoji because I'm basically setting up or was setting up a moonshot Monday video about here's how SpaceX could do a non-traditional IPO essentially direct listing very similar to what Slack um, did with their IPO very similar to what Spotify did with these IPO these companies with consumers um, who follow the company, who have a big uh, like grassroots movement, who want to invest, unlocking that. They don't actually need to go through bankers. Uh, they can just do more and more secondary offerings or like sort of events, uh, liquidity events to sort of come to a market price, can be more volatile. You don't have to pay investment bankers what could be a 7% fee. You don't have to do the traditional um, IPO roadshow process. Like it's a totally new revolutionary way to take companies public that is just taking off. I think it's going to continue to gain huge steam. Um, tying into that is a software company, which I've covered on the channel, Carta, um, which I think is in, on the cusp of totally disrupting the entire investment banking process, taking this direct listing model really to the mainstream, unlocking uh, what I think is going to be access to equity in the most exciting startups in the world, solving this huge problem of the youngest, most excited investors not being able to invest in these technology companies at early stages. So Carta is a company that I use for hyperchange to manage my invest, uh, investors. That's how I've raised small amounts of angel investment all through this platform without lawyers. I think it's transforming at least my personal business. And there's so many amazing companies that are on their platform um, whose cap tables they will eventually unlock. They put out a blog post about this thing called Carta X, 
um, which they're about to release. They have a huge space in New York that they're setting up to basically make an exchange for companies to direct list directly on Carta, or that's my understanding. I think that has huge potential. Um, I'm just a huge fan of what Carta is building because I think they're the closest company to unlocking and being this middleman of getting us into all these early technology companies. And so the more and more as I'm like, um, as they get close, and just to give you an example of how this works, like what Carta is doing now for some of their biggest companies or what companies similar to Carta are doing is if you want to start getting more and more liquidity for your employees, you're a huge company, they've been working there for 10 years, they want to sell some stock, um, they'll do like quarterly events. So it's basically like the stock opens up for trading for like once a quarter, a, a tiny window period of time, and they can take in all these buy orders, take in all these sell orders, and make some transactions happen. So they're starting to provide liquidity to these companies. Let's say you have these events once a quarter, you can start to accelerate the cadence of these events. They're Therefore, the pricing is going to get more accurate, and eventually you're going to get more and more closer to what we have in the public equity markets. And I think this is a sort of new hybrid direct listing approach that isn't IPOing on the NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange, but has huge potential because it's less listing requirements, less auditing requirements. Um, you don't have to disclose as much. I mean, it's super burdensome to go public. This is why people don't do it. It's super costly. It's just a really old pre-internet process. And I think is with bankers, uh, with a roadshow that's totally right for disruption. So Carta is in the backbone of what's happening in this investment world is building this platform to really connect investors and investments. And then I'm like, well, SpaceX is the perfect company to use Carta. They should be one of the first people to be immediately in a meeting with Carta, talking about Carta X, talking about how do we get SpaceX to not really go IPO the traditional way, which is what Elon Musk, he said he doesn't want to do until the Mars mission is secured, which is years and years away. Um, but how do we get your employees liquidity? How do we get act all these millions of fans who are tuning into you know SpaceX videos on YouTube, who are tweeting it or watching your live streams, who are desperate to invest, who believe in this company? How do we actually get them access into SpaceX? This is a huge issue um, in terms of like, I think one of the biggest Tesla's advantages has been this grassroots movements of shareholders and people being saying like, I'm a shareholder of the company. I believe I want to invest. I want to buy the products. You feel like a part of it. You go to the shareholder meetings. Like Carta's mission is create more owners. And I think that is exactly what we need. That's exactly what has helped Tesla become, you know, as much as they get a bunch of like, oh, being public so hard, there was the short selling thing. And I totally get that. But the flip side of that has been, it also created millions or tens of thousands of fans and owners who then bought the products, who were cheering for it, who were the company's marketing department and have been a huge building block of the success. Um, and spreading the word about Tesla. And I think the same thing could happen for SpaceX. But if you do this, you know, in this new direct listing approach on Carta, I don't think they're going to have short sellers. That's not a piece of the platform they've integrated yet. And I don't think they're even working on. So the entire part of short sellers manipulating the stock goes away. Um, you don't have the same reporting requirements and incentive structure um, as you would if you went public on the New York Stock Exchange, NASDAQ. It's totally getting away from that quarter to quarter approach, way more long term thinking like owners of companies, investors, not traders. And the flip side of that is I think SpaceX is their big biggest competitive advantage is, you know, a, a company is a group of people, is their employees, is their engineers. And if you want to incentivize your engineers correctly, you need to be paying them in stock of the company. Um, that's what SpaceX has done. There's a ton of people with a huge amount of, who made a huge amount of uh, money on SpaceX stock. I mean, SpaceX is a privately held company, recently valued at $34 billion. Uh, you know, so they're becoming a huge company, but their employees don't have liquidity. They can't sell when they want to sell. And so I think that's a huge friction towards attracting the best talent. And I think that's a big pain point for employees is not having liquidity on their share price. So this uh, SpaceX listing on Carta would solve both of those problems, unlocking it, giving it to the public, um, also allowing their employees to get liquidity for the company. Um, so I, I don't know. And I just think Maybe SpaceX doesn't need to do it. They don't need the money, but it would just be, for, they don't need, SpaceX doesn't need to sell any of their own equity if they want to dilute. They can just give a marketplace for employees. But I don't know. I just think the opportunity here is is ridiculous. And the amount, and just the response I've gotten from every single person who I talk to about wanting to invest in SpaceX is like so passionate and so just like, oh, I would love to. Like, this is something I believe in. I want to go to Mars. I believe in SpaceX. I believe in Starlink. But like, there's just no way to do it. And it's like this hopeless look that I think, it's just so, so frustrating and sucks. And um, and I just felt guilty of the fact that I was going to get invested and nobody is going to get invested. So there's just so many layers to this. And the other thing is like, you might be like, okay, well, if you're not a credit investor, this doesn't matter anyway, because Carter won't open up to you. I think that's all about to change too. And that's also content that I have planned and in the works is I want to repropose basically come up with my own version of how to prove you're a credit investor it has nothing to do with your net worth. Basically, you fill out a little quiz or a form about what you know, then you can become a credit investor. This rule that we have in place of where only super rich people can invest in early stage technology companies is 
massively contributing to the wealth gap in this country. And I just think it's such a backward system um, and we're not getting enough. Like, I think the valuation of SpaceX would go up dramatically if it was opened up to more and more investors, which significantly increases the value of the equity of all the employees, gives them more liquidity, incentivizes them better. Like, it's just unlocking huge value in the system. So another piece of this, if you're thinking longer term, is how do we change the rules to let everybody into these deals? That's also something I'm scheming and working on. And now coming back to the news today of SpaceX being like, we want to IPO just Starlink. So I was not thinking about this, and this is why I'm just recording this off the cuff now because I want to just talk about it. And Starlink um, is a satellite service that SpaceX has been working on for a couple of years. It's already the largest satellite network in orbit around Earth. They have 240 satellites out there. It's launching this year. It seems crazy, but SpaceX, I mean, their, their technology right now is launching rockets cheaper than anyone else, hugely cheaper than anyone. Uh, that's been their business up until now, about $3 billion in revenue, two, two or $3 billion in revenue. So you're trading about 10 times price sales just on this launch business, but cheaper launches means that it's way more affordable to launch satellites in space. One of SpaceX's biggest customers or many of their biggest customers are companies launching satellites into space for their own networks. Now SpaceX is like, screw it, we came up with our own satellites, low earth orbit. We're gonna need thousands of these, but we're gonna do our own satellite internet service, give internet to everyone in the world. Um, there's some really crazy quotes in this Bloomberg article um, where, where Gwen Shotwell, the same conference where she said they might IPO is saying, this is going to turn SpaceX into a company that's providing service to consumers, which we are excited about. Um, and she said that the service, which is going to have global coverage and will cost less than what you are paying now for about five to 10 times the speed you are getting. This is a totally huge business. I mean, internet, so we, I mean, I don't need to pitch the internet to you, but internet access is a massive business. We're talking hundreds of billions of potential um, of, for a valuation for a company that launches a global internet service that is actually what they're saying. So, and if you think about it, the cost to do this thing isn't that much. I mean, they're already doing the launches. Once you launch all these satellites up there, you're just collecting the revenue from them, maintaining the network. Um, so if SpaceX needs capital, which it sounds like they do to make this all happen, I think they should be raising it from the people. Um, but I'm kind of bummed that they're trying to put Starlink into this separate box as a separate company. Um, and this is where I guess my vision for how SpaceX should IPO is totally different than what SpaceX and Elon Musk are thinking, which is that he wants to maintain ownership of core SpaceX and is just very worried about the long-term incentives of the company if they go public, which I agree is a massive concern. And so I think the way to get combat that would be to maybe they've actually come up with a genius plan in IPOing Starlink. But I just think it's a huge bummer because the way I was thinking about SpaceX is you're investing in this core reusable rocket technology. Yes, a satellite internet service is the second thing to be monetized on this launch technology after just literally launching stuff for other companies. But who knows what that'll be else will be after it. Like I've said asteroid mining, which I think is absurd. Maybe, I don't know. I'm wondering, curious if Elon Musk even thinks that'll be practical in our lifetimes. But there's just so many things about you know, this building the railroad to space and that core reusable rocket technology. And that's what I want to invest in, not a company that's monetizing an internet service, but a technology that is getting things to space and building the railroads to space. I don't think we're just going to Mars. I think we're going to a ton of different planets. And the company that's leading that sort of railroad infrastructure of connecting humanity to different planets, different solar systems, or whatever that may be, is going to be SpaceX. And so that's such a big vision that I want a part of that I think so many people want a part of. Um, and I, that's kind of one of my big theories about why this is so exciting, what, why I've been so pumped about SpaceX beyond Tesla is why I want to make it my next big investment is because I think solving all our sustainability issues here on Earth is one thing, but the more, and that's kind of like a defensive safe move. But the actual exciting thing is like, let's go explore. Let's go do things. I think my generation, millennials, like the one thing we spent, love to spend money on is experiences, travel. Like I think we value just exploring and we're super adventurous. And I think that's just in human nature. Like, and we're going to keep expanding like crazy. So as much as it's hard to see right now how the financial return from going to Mars makes sense, I just think inherently this is something that humans want to do and that it's necessary and that it's inevitable and that space like Star Wars, Star Trek, like I think those are previews of the future, not sci-fi uh, fictional worlds. And that's really where we're going to as, as a species. It's so, so exciting, such a big vision. And I think this is really a cause that all of humans can rally around. It's not, doesn't matter what country you're a part of, what political party you're a part of. It's like us humans, like smart monkeys, are figuring out how to go to new planets. This is a game changer. This is so dope. It's like literally the most exciting thing that's ever happened for humans. Uh, would be going to Mars. And Elon Musk thinks we could actually get there in four years. Um, they're launching the satellite service that's going to be up to up this summer that's going to be able to fund all of that mission to Mars. So like this is actually happening like in my lifetime, like in the next decade, we're going to make huge progress on this. I mean, I think this is going to take over all the news, all the headlines as it should. Um, I think it could potentially drive a huge, massive upside. Like everyone's talking about, oh, we're in a stock bubble. We're in this equity bubble. I'm like, 
who does not want to invest in humanity right now? Like we're at the biggest growth thing we've ever done. We're about to conquer a whole new planet. That's the the biggest, most exciting growth opportunity humans have ever had. And so there's so much exciting potential for SpaceX. I would totally invest in Starlink as itself as IPOs because it would probably be cheaper than overall investing in SpaceX. But I think this is just one little business cog of a much, much bigger vision that I want, that I kind of just thought would be better as a conglomerate. So I'm still trying to process all of this, but um, I think another layer of this behind the scenes and the reason why I think I'm potentially getting access to a SpaceX equity and why a bunch of people have messaged me after I tweeted this, like, oh, I might be able to get you in, like, I'm hearing about this, is because I think SpaceX is currently in the process of cleaning up their cap table, um, getting rid of a lot of unnecessary holders, and trying to get ready to make their equity more accessible, whether that's just the Starlink piece of the equity, whether that's all of SpaceX. I think things are moving behind the scenes for SpaceX to open this up to investors. So that is the good line thing. That's the silver lining about all of this news. But I'm a, I am can't help but be bummed that it's only Starlink and that SpaceX's equity is still locked. And now we're kind of complicating the entire structure. But the more and more I think of it, if the really important thing is to go to Mars, then it's like you do not want to risk that by selling up control of the company. And that's why control of the core SpaceX as its technology is so important for Elon. And that's why he has to keep his 50% plus ownership stake and ha like no matter what, and even has to keep a cushion above that. So if something happens and they do need to dilute, they still have a cushion where he wouldn't need to go below 50%. And so, but I don't think dilution has to occur. I think you just have to make a liquid market on Carta so your employees can sell your equity. I think if you do this, this is my pitch of why you don't need IPO Star Starlink. I think the value of SpaceX doubles to like 60, 65 billion. Um, and then I think you can sell way less equity to get way more capital. You can give your employees liquidity. You can immediately start getting all of these people like myself invested in the company, get way more pumped about it, start making more content about it, start spreading the word even faster, just as the technology and the excitement ramps. They're about to launch humans to the space station, I think, from the U.S. like this year, which hasn't happened in a decade. Um, and I want to give a shout out to Tim, the everyday astronaut, because I got to meet him. Amazing dude, amazing channel, um, and just talk to him about SpaceX and what they're doing. And I really didn't understand it just how fast they're moving, how exciting this is, how much is about to happen in the next, like, let alone decade, five years for this business that it makes me so, so excited to put in capital. Um, and I just think them disrupting Boeing and Lockheed Martin with launches is just like a joke to what this business is going to be. And and Starlink is the first part of that. But yeah, I guess that's a good, a good, point, a good point to end it on is like, I guess is the pitch to, to, to SpaceX and Elon Musk. It's like, do you want this equity to go to even if it's just Starlink, they should do Starlink on Carta. Because even, do you want this to go down as like the people who made all the money on Starlink were just VCs, who rich guys, who made rich people richer, who put money in that could care less about what you were doing. That's what it is right now. And even for just like letting in a billion dollars worth of capital from 10,000 people or whatever, you know, I think these diehard fans, I just think that would, you know, it's, it's a more equitable distribution. It's... I don't know. Maybe it's like we're all too greedy to want to get access to the cap table, but it's just like I think this is just hitting the head on so many different convergence of trends of like people want to invest in technology. They can't. They see it. They are willing to buy in the vision, but they can't, which means the SpaceX's equity is depressed, which means you've been selling more and more pieces of your company at an undervalued stake because there's been you basically but there's been a bottleneck on who can buy your stock. So it's been hurting SpaceX. Um, and I just think there's the technology has never been there ready for to really do this direct listing thing. But now it's happening with Carta. There is a huge amount of money from Goldman Sachs. Mark Andreessen, legend of the financial world, joined the board of directors. I mean, I think this is all happening regardless of SpaceX or not, at least on Carta's end and startups like Carta making all these private companies more accessible. But to me, this is like the example, like this is the one to do. This is the moment to like IPO the most exciting tech company in the world with zero bankers, zero Wall Street, zero big money, actually give it to the people. And you get people like me spreading the word about it. I'm, I don't not want to take a cut. I don't even want to get in if I'm not letting everyone else get in. Like, I just think that's the mindset that you're actually helping, um, that you're pushing forward with all of this. And that seems super important, More, maybe more so for the financial markets than for SpaceX, but it's just crazy. And so anyway, my pitch is I think Elon Musk and Carta need to meet. And this is the team up that should happen to start un unlocking more and more access to SpaceX. I think there's a huge pent up demand for it. Um, and that's where I'm at with this. I, hopefully I'll make more content. I, I think actually maybe I can do like a one minute on why I would invest in SpaceX. So I think, okay, $34 billion. Why do I want to buy SpaceX stock at 34? Let's call it $40 billion because they're doing two to 3 billion in launch revenue. Now that's paying all their expenses, letting them develop a crazy amount of technology. 
Um, that's awesome. But I think they've de-risked a huge piece of their business model. They've proven they can relaunch rockets. So I think this is one of the most important technological breakthroughs that like has ever happened. More people don't know about it. The news isn't reporting on it, but it's a critical building block of why we're going to be able to go to space. Rockets are reusable. Now, this is a technology. The financials today are a lagging indicator of the monetization potential of this technology. Starlink is a perfect example of that because now that you've decreased that cost of that launch technology, you can start launching up other things. Now, all of a sudden, we have a whole new multi-hundred billion dollar potential internet business that got spun out of nowhere, even though the financials only show two to three billion dollars in launch revenue. And so I think SpaceX, it's not really investing in the business today. You're investing in the technology they're developing and how that can be monetized for the future. And I see decades and decades of runway, of honestly unlimited runway, of humans continually expanding into space, continually expanding the market for this new railroad infrastructure. And so when I think about what SpaceX is building, um, the biggest companies when we started America, when we were exploring historically, were all railroads. The second you built that pipeline, it just unlocked an explosion of new commerce and entrepreneurship, which is like so good for society. Um, you know, my motto of investing in the future you believe in, like, I just believe in this so hard. I think this is exactly what we need to be doing as humans. So I'm so on board with that. And I just think that we want to set up a colony of millions of people on Mars. Like that's going to require billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars of launches. And that's all going to go to SpaceX, the company. So I think from that way they could make money there. But I think Starlink justifies the valuation of 100 or 200 billion if they actually do have a global internet service that works. It's five or 10 times faster. I mean, this is a super risky company. It's rockets investing. So I'm looking at this as like venture capital style investing, SpaceX. There's a huge chance it goes to zero, which would be extremely sad. But I think as an investor, you want to put that cap on. Like, of course, SpaceX could fail. Um, but just as an exciting potential, do I see 10 times upside from 40 billion in the super long term? Totally. Um, and so that's why financially I get so excited about this. And it's like, just like Tesla, like you're investing, you know, the battery technology that they have, um, the autonomous driving technology they have. Sure, they're they're making a billion in cash flow this year. They're doing great. They're growing. But I think those are super lagging indicators of the actual monetizable value and just the true intrinsic value of the technology they've developed. The exact same thing is for SpaceX. You're investing in the smartest engineer and inventor of our time with the smartest multi-thousand person team of engineers in the world all working together to get this done. Um, tying back to why they need to provide liquidity and do this to get those smartest engineers liquidity on their stock, which is going to make them even more pumped, allow them to tell their friends about it, get even smarter engineers, continue to get that ball rolling. Um, but yeah, it's really just, it would be a tragedy if like we all watched this amazing technology get commercialized and never had access to it. That's that's my two cents. But anyway, I think Elon Musk and his team at SpaceX should meet with Carta ASAP, get in a room, figure out how to open this up to more credit investors. The time is right. The technology is there. SpaceX's timing is good. Um, there's just a new way to go public without bankers, without short sellers, with less scrutiny on the company. And I think this is going to be a huge win-win for all parties involved. Are there legality issues, like governance issues, like about space? K-Bone asks, who makes the rules in space? That's what I was wondering. So once we get Mars set up, like the U.S. just set up the Space Force, is that not going to be the biggest, like if I was a government, would there not be a FOMO bidding war for, can I, I'll buy $10 billion on just to get one seat on that rocket if that means I can plant a flag and get a thousand square miles of Mars for the U.S.? Yeah, you don't think that's a bidding war between the largest mo people with the most capital in the world, sovereign wealth funds? and central banks and governments to try and bid on who gets the seat of that rocket to claim it or how that even works. I mean, that's what we're talking about. And when we say, how do you monetize this technology? It's technology that governments to me would spend billions of dollars to get their hands on and the drop of a hat the second it works. And you know, 34 billion SpaceX on some levels, like kind of a pip squeak in the grand scheme of things, like the faster you get that valuation up, the more you're your own boss, the more, you know, if you're at Amazon or Apple and you're worth a trillion, and you have tens of billion in the bank, like who's messing with you? Right. Nobody's messing with you. You know, you're as big as governments. And so SpaceX, I feel like they're breaking out to get to that level, but they can get to that level faster with this idea. More capital at a higher valuation, more transparency um, are all things that they could have. And, but that, you know, SpaceX has to do everything here in the US because it's so sensitive. Like I didn't realize that, but like, these are like, this is why it's like, I got a tour of SpaceX actually. So shout out to SpaceX. Like when I went there in the third row who helped set up that tour and it, dude, it's mind blowing the stuff they have going on. Like, it's just incredible how much cool, amazing technology they're developing in Los Angeles, in America. Like this is what I'm talking about. Like the news should be all over this story. Like the U S has gone from totally falling behind in space, totally falling behind on everything to like, wait, Oh, now we're actually leading it. We have the dopest space company in the world who's actually going to totally reinvent the opportunity in space, get us way ahead in the space race, which is like what we should all be caring about. Should we not be subsidizing this on a huge level? Like probably, 
Um, is it not bringing thousands of en the smartest world's engineers into the U.S. working here, paying taxes? Yes. Like these are all like, wow. You know, you could say the same thing for Tesla, but um, in terms of strategic military importance, SpaceX could be one of the most important assets in the world. So that's why you think about these larger defense companies worth hundreds of billions of dollars in market cap. To me, SpaceX already has technology that dwarfs the potential of those, yet it's worth a fraction of that. So that's another layer of like the economic case. Um, but we're just getting, to me, it's like so, so exciting stuff. Like all our problems on Earth just seem so minuscule. The second we start going to space and exploring the stars and have something to work together towards, um, which the world really needs right now and does not have. And so... Yeah, so Kevin brought up a crazy point, which is how do you go, how do you balance, are we expanding into space to expand consciousness and expand society and just have this like amazing free utopia? Or is it becoming in this weird, you know, sci-fi movie space race where everyone's trying to get there as fast as they possibly can and governments are, the US government nationalizes SpaceX immediately because the technology is so valuable and they're like, we're just going to go to Mars by ourselves and claim it for the US, for the Space Force, like, that could totally happen. And Leonella walks in. Good. <laughs> Which is basically done. Unless, Leo, what do you, what should I talk about about the SpaceX IPO? Because now they came out with the thing that like Starlink is going to try an IPO and spin out. Um, do they have enough funding to do like, to do all the CapEx needed for like the fleet? Or do they need an IPO to fund part of that? So do they need, do they have enough money to like launch Starlink or yeah, why? Like why are they uh, yeah. So sp that, okay. That's a great point because SpaceX probably needs money because they always, SpaceX try and raises money like once every six months to a year, it seems like they raise 500 million or a billion. So it seems like the business still does need money. And so that's why this whole argument to make them pseudo go public makes even more sense. And then like Leo just brought up excellent point. Why would you go public to raise money? You're not going to sell stock in something if you don't need to. And so, but they want to compartmentalize that equity cap table. Say SpaceX is going to own a piece of Starlink and sell off a piece of it. Um, so, that, so it seems like they do need to raise money, which is an excellent point. So that brings me back to like, okay, well, even if they just want to do Starlink, it still makes sense to almost do it on Carta um, because otherwise, what are you going to do? The traditional IPO process, go through a banker, um, pay the banker a huge amount of fees, only let the VC, you know, and your banker, the banker's friends and homies into the deal, just like every IPO works. Or is this the moment where you can actually open up Starlink to the people who are going to want to use Starlink? And then you get all those people, since it's a consumer facing thing, all those owners, because Card is creating more owners, can become advocates can, for the product, can start using the product because their investors can start telling people for the product. Just like Tesla, you'll never need to spend a dime on marketing because you create that grassroots movements out of nowhere. So, I even think, regardless if they don't want to do the whole SpaceX IPO together, which would be a bummer, and they just want to IPO Starlink because they need a couple billion dollars to start funding those launches, let's do it to the people. Starlink for the people, internet for the people, funded by the people. Like, anything else, Leo? Adam Jonas had an interesting question like a couple quarters ago about like uh, fitting Teslas with you know whatever is needed to like access the internet from Starlink. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not IPO related, but so, it seems like a Leo brings up why does on every single recent conference call, it seemed, it was definitely on the last conference call, but I feel like on many conference calls, Adam Jonas is like, why don't we put a Starlink receiver in a Tesla? How would, and he tried to get really crafty with it the way he asked on the last conference call, it was like, okay, okay, you don't want to talk about it. But in theory, if you could get a Starlink receiver small enough into a car, how would that change the customer experience in theory? if you were to do that. And Elon Musk is like, we're still going to use 5G pretty much everywhere because it's better and faster. Yet, now you have Gwen Shotwell saying, we're going to IPO our whole internet service. It's going to be less price than what you use for five to 10 times the speed. So my, one of the theories that I've personally heard is they're significantly downplaying the potential of Starlink just because it's so disruptive. And they've been, maybe now they're ready to start talking about it. And that's why Gwen Shotwell is saying this at a conference because they have 240 satellites in the air. They're starting to launch them. The launch technology is perfected. Like, it's already working. This is already happening. It's going to launch in a matter of months. Now's the time to start talking about it. They've just been downplaying the specs and how disruptive it is because we're talking about disrupting a massive multi-hundred billion dollar telecommunications industry that does not that Tesla is currently su supremely reliable on for their entire connected car fleet. So there's a lot of, you know, if you want to get into geopolitical, political conspiracy theories, you can get pretty deep on like that whole side of things. But 
Um, my point is, when Elon Musk downplays the potential for Starlink and the receiver and the potential for Starlink and Tesla to collaborate, um, I think he is slightly downplaying it. Maybe it's true and they just don't. It's just a coincidence that Tesla's cars are super reliant on internet and that he's launching its own internet service and they just won't happen to partner up. But I have to think that's not what's going on. So it's like, um, and I also think Adam Jonas, like, as much as I make fun of him on the podcast sometimes and like laugh at his crazy questions, like he's also in a lot of meetings that I'm not in with a lot of really rich people and people, executives at SpaceX and Tesla and Elon Musk's people and Morgan Stanley people who are way deeper in this industry than I am. And, you know, he's asking this question for a reason. But the flip side of that is like, why does it matter if Star Tesla uses Starlink? Like that's kind of where I've come from this from. Like your Tesla is already connected to the internet. It already goes as it, the internet's already as fast as you need it to be for your Tesla. So the consumer experience wouldn't change if they just switched an internet provider. It's not like internet bandwidth has been limiting Tesla's performance of their vehicles or computers on wheels. Maybe they have, but I don't think that's been the case. So I thought Starlink was going to be like a revenue stream for SpaceX. Why are they kind of like asking it? So why does SpaceX want to sell Starlink if Starlink's going to make so much money? That's what Leo just said. That's a really interesting point because they sell Starlink up front. Okay, maybe like you sell Starlink 10 billion valuation. Let's say it goes perfectly. They sell 25% of it for 2.5 billion. Um, then SpaceX gets 2.5 billion in funding without diluting their core equity, but diluting their Starlink ownership. Then they're giving away this Starlink revenue as a piece of SpaceX, which is this recurring subscriber base revenue, super consistent to even out that launch revenue. Um, basically, it'd be a really good thing for the core cash flow situation of SpaceX. But then the counter argument is like, oh, well, we won't need that recurring cash flow because we're going to get a big 2.5 billion check up front. And then Starlink IPOs and it goes from to 10 billion to 25 billion in two years. And then we're going to sell another 25 percent and that'll be 4 billion or 5 billion or 7 billion, whatever. And then SpaceX will get another big cash infusion and using Starlink's equity price as sort of an ATM to keep funding the core SpaceX. Is that smarter than just launching Starlink and use, getting that revenue? Um so this is the question that probably Tesla's or SpaceX and Elon Musk are thinking through super carefully. Is it worth it to sell it all up front? Totally depends on the valuation. I think if you wanted to get the highest valuation, once again, you should probably go to the people doing these direct listing sort of things. Um, but that's, yeah, I don't know. I'm super interested in that. And then the other thing Leo brought up is, okay, well, are they going to be regulated? Can you launch like people are worried about you're not going to be able to see things because Starlink is like blocking astronomers are all pissed. Um, and then I already heard one theory about like, is it, you know, is all this internet being beamed down from space, like going to cause cancer? Like there's all these theories people have about why this is the end of the world. Um, I think the core of this is like, <laughs> I don't, this is probably going to be not a, a hot, good hot take, but it's like one of my lawyer friends said, like possession is 90% of the law. So the fact that SpaceX can literally just launch these things and do it, like regardless of what the laws are or anything is like. I think that's kind of half the battle here. Like, what, like they're launching their own satellite on their own rocket with their own money. Like, what you know, you can complain all you want, but you got to get a pretty strong legal case to make them to s stop doing that. So I think that's one end of it. The other end of it is I think Elon Musk is a lot smarter than I am, and he thought through all this and the pros and cons, and they're trying to think this through. The other end of it, you know, I, I hear so many theories constantly about all these conspiracy theories about why new technologies are bad. I just think people get scared of new technologies and, like, the whole thing about people seeing the satellites, like right when you launch them, they're seeing them, but then I've heard they kind of float up and they're harder to see. I don't know. I've never seen any of the SpaceX Starlink satellites yet, but would it be the end of the world if there were we saw more satellites floating around, but we all got global internet? I don't know. Maybe that's kind of a fair trade-off. Um, is there going to be too much space junk because there's too many satellites that are breaking and you have to replace them every couple of years? I don't know. I mean, these are all questions. I mean, every time you came, come to, or every time you commercialize a super disruptive technology, something totally new, there's going to be totally new ta challenges. So that's one way to look at it. But um, I think if SpaceX is ready to IPO Starlink as its own company, these are things that are like the biggest things, the risk factors of the statement of the SEC disclosures or whatever. Um, you know, this is all stuff they're going to have had to have talked to and have seriously thought through before they're even getting ready to IPO. So the fact that they're getting ready to IPO to me seems like they've cleared most of the regulatory hurdles to get this off the ground. And the other good thing that makes me think that is it's not like just Tesla that's doing this. Apple, top secret satellite team that wants to run their entire internet network on low or Earth orbit satellites. Amazon trying to, uh, Blue Origin trying to invest in low Earth satellite network as fast as possible. Like it doesn't seem like this is some crazy out there idea. It seems like every tech company is racing to do this as fast as possible because they view this as the holy grail of the new internet. 
And so that also kind of gives me comfort. SpaceX is like early investors, like all these like venture fund, private equity funds, maybe they were pushing for this to get a bit of liquidity or something. Yes. Okay. It gives them yes. Liquidity, I mean there is. A, okay. So that's a great angle. This is kind of a nerdy financial thing, but just to show you how twisted the world of VC is. Um, so if you're a VC fund, you have like eight years of your life, right? Then you have to return capital to all your rich people who you've been making richer. So if you invested in SpaceX five or eight years ago, your fund is coming to the, and that's assuming you invested when you started your VC fund. If your VC fund's coming to the end of life, you're probably going to have to start liquidating to just get cash out for your investors, regardless of what you think of the company's valuation at that point. Plus you're probably already up huge. So that's why people like me and a ton of people watching, if you've been like in the grapevine in the know, you've been hearing that people are willing to start selling their SpaceX equity because I think there's a lot of early huge VC funds who want to sell it. So, and this is a, a yet yeah, a dumb reason that's causing sp friction on SpaceX's whole model because they do the traditional VC style approach. They're limited to these funds who think in a short term investment horizon, who have investors that aren't the funds. There's layers and layers. They're not probably, they don't give a crap about SpaceX's mission is my get go. They're just selling because they have to for these institutional reasons. If you would raise money from the people they wouldn't have had these institutional timelines. They wouldn't be selling. Uh, they could be holding on for much longer. So I think that's an interesting thing, but that's part of what's happening right now for SpaceX and why the company appears to be trying to clean up their cap table is because they need have all these VCs who need to liquidate. Um, and that's sort of that weird financial like law of how long VC funds are is actually dictating a lot of SpaceX's fundraising and liquidity events in the background, which is kind of just dumb. But I think that's a big piece of what's happening. So... I hope that's enough food for thought. Signing off for the second time. This was awesome. Um, got Need to get all your schemes. Um, please let it in the comments below. SpaceX, bringing it to the people. Let's make it happen. See you guys next time. Peace.